All right, friends. Um, so I guess I should go ahead and start it. My um, uh, grand rounds for this morning is going to be about topical hemostatic agents. Um, it was kind of difficult to come up with a topic. I have multiple topics and I finally settled with this one. Um, I feel like uh, topical hemostatic agents are very versatile in their use. Um, and this will be hopefully a good review for everybody and some of the things that we need to be aware of and certainly cancel our patients. Um, they are really great tools to have when we need them, of course. Okay, guys, so let's do it. Um, so the objectives for this presentation, we're going to review some basics. Um, certainly we're gonna review the most common uh, hemostatic agents and the different groups. Uh, we will uh, talk about some of the versatilities and applications that we can uh, see these agents and certainly some of the complications that we can also uh, encounter such as risk of infection, adhesion formations, and some confusing findings and imaging. And the cost, some of these agents are quite expensive as you guys can imagine. Um, and why not? Let's begin with some hemostasis review. Um, as you guys know, hemostasis is divided into two stages, primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Uh, primary hemostasis is mostly the formation of a soft uh, platelet plug. And the secondary hemostasis is when you get a more stable clot and that's when the coagulation cascade comes in. Um, and also the agents that we're gonna be talking about today, they participate in stages of the second, uh, secondary hemostasis as well. And here is a drawing of our favorite coagulation cascade. So uh, basically, um, you have two branches, the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway is mostly happens when you have vessel damage and you have collagen exposed, whereas the intrinsic uh, pathways, trauma, surgery, mm -hmm. you can also encounter that in the extrinsic pathways, trauma due to surgery. And you have several uh, factors that uh, involved in each of these pathways, but an intrinsic pathway, the most uh, remarkable one would be factor seven and the intrinsic pathway is in factor eight. They will ultimately activate factor X uh, to XA, which are going in to drive the conversion to thrombin. And thrombin is going in to drive the conversion to fibrinogen to fibrin. And bingo, we're going to start making some clots. Um, also, there is a disclosure that, again, this presentation is going to have a lot of names, brand names of these hemostatic agents, so there is no benefit, only educational in this presentation. Um, so when to use topical hemostatic agents? These are to be used in place where uh, electrocardio cannot be used. Um, Perhaps you're close to large vessels, perhaps you're close to the ureter, um, or sometimes areas that they are difficult to get access as well. They are also used for, uh, mostly for slow venous bleeds in what we call oozing, general oozing at the peritoneal surfaces. They are not uh, to be used prophylactically, uh, in the bent that you say, oh, this patient has a high risk to start bleeding. They are not meant for that. Um, and they are also not meant for fast uh, risk bleeding, of course. Um, and the categories that we are going to be talking about are going to be the physical, the biological, and caustic categories. Some of the risk and contraindications, I went ahead and Put this at front, I was gonna do this at the end, but I feel like if we put it at front, you would start keeping in mind and some of the things that I'm pointing in, this, in the slides to follow. Um, and these are certainly discussions that we need to have with our patients as well when you um, consent them. So some of the risk and contraindications, again, these are foreign bodies. And as you will learn, they will have varying absorption times. 
And because of that, they also have the potential uh, for infection, uh, tinnitus of infection at the site of use. This is kind of, as I was studying and preparing for this presentation, you know, they were I ran into some studies that they were like, yes, this is true, but this is also confounding because patients that are bleeding intraoperatively, you know, that we're using these products, those are also patients that have lengthier surgeries, perhaps they have blood transfusions, more, more, I guess, more exposure. Um, so they also just that would increase the risk of infection. Certainly, this, some of these products are made are animal derived, porcine and bovine. So we have to be culturally aware of these products. Um, there, some of these products are also human derived. So because of that, they are considered blood products, and we have to co properly consent our patients with that. And because they are blood products, they will carry the risk of infection, such as HIV, hepatitis, and parvovirus. Um, and again, because they are foreign and they're animal products, some of these are, um, they have an increased risk of allergic reactions. Some of these reactions are pretty severe, um, leading to catastrophic bleeding on re-exposure. Okay, so let's start with the physical hemostatic agents. Um, so physical hemostatic agents, these products, again, they are, um, they have all sorts of substrates and metrics. Um, they are, they can be made out of cellulose, gelatin, starch, and collagen. They do require the intact coagulation cascade, again, because they mostly work at the level of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. They do not touch the common pathway, so they do require an intact coagulation cascade. So these are not really used for patients who are in DIC or perhaps are on anticoagulation. Um, this patient, these uh, agents are also cheaper. Well. Um, the first one that I will mention is your cellulose base. Um, so your surge cell, they are uh, other names for them as well, as you can see. The, the one that we have is surge cell. It was introduced back in 1943. It is available as powder and mesh. It is quickly, quickly absorbed. It's probably one of the fastest absorbable the agents that we're going to see. It's absorbed in one to two weeks. It is plant derived. It is acidic because it's acidic is going to give them two good qualities. One of them is going to decrease uh, the risk of infection. So it has antibacterial properties and they will also enhance thrombosis and induce basic constriction. One thing that I was not aware of um, because of the acidic pH of surge cell, this will inactivate uh, topical thrombin products. So these are not to be combined with topical thrombin products. And some more, a little bit more in surge cell. Um, surge cell, um, as, as I was mentioned before, some of these agents are at increased risk of infection and adhesion formation. But a surge cell, um, it actually, the, there is not that much of a risk of uh, formations of adhesions, peritoneal adhesions. There is actually a product that is made of, um, of the same material that oxidizes as cellulose. It's called Intercet. That is just, it prevents adhesions itself. It's made by the same brand. It's just a changes in the degree of oxidation and the weaving of the film. And there was, I ran into this study um, that it was, it went over the adhesions formation in rat models. It was a, it was a small study. I think they were like 40 rats. Basically what they did, uh, they, they uh, these rats went through a laparotomy. They uh, had a sickum injury. They put some surge cell, they closed them up. They reopen, uh, certainly they have a control group on the surge cell group, and they reopen like 14 days later to evaluate um, the amount of adhesion formation. And 
the group in surgery cell, there was significantly less adhesion formation, which that was different. Um, and then again, with surgery cell, there was a lower risk of infection, could be because of the pH, but also it's absorbed quicker than the other ones as well. So that could be um, part of it. Um, and the uh, again, like we will see multiple times with surgery cell and other agents, they could be mistaken for abscess formation, uh, like abscess in imaging studies. Um, one thing that I did learn when I was studying this, um, apparently there are radiology findings that you can, even though these agents look like abscesses, they are radiology findings that you can say, okay, this is not an abscess, this is more like hemostatic agent. Uh, an abscess will have like an enhancing ring uh, formation and air fluid levels, whereas these agents will not have that. They will have bubbles, they will not have fluid levels, and they will be well demarcated as well. Um, the other group we have, the gelatin base. So these are the gel form, surgery foam. This are also has been introduced for a while. Um, you have a mass powder or a sponge. Most common, we see the sponge. They absorb over four to six weeks. Uh, porcelain derived. One thing with these guys, they also certainly are physical, but some there were some comments about mechanical hemostasis because they will increase in size and weight. Uh, so when they do that, they would just compress the area as well and enhance the hemostasis. Uh, they are, because they expand, uh, when they absorb fluids, they expand, they will increase in size, they can, there's a risk of compression, so there is caution to use in tight spaces uh, to prevent compression, necrosis of tissue. Um, these guys have a neutral pH, so there's not really antimicrobial properties, and as we will see later, uh, gelatin-based products at link with an increased risk of infection as well. These uh, products are widely used in OBGYN. We have seen them uh, used in, at the time of C-section, hysterectomies. You can also use them at the time of minimal invasive surgeries. Never seen that myself, but apparently you can drive this foam through the uh, trucker. So I'm assuming you probably need a, like at least a tan to drive these pieces um, through truckers. This one, so Arista, I was able to put a picture up of Arista on this one because Arista is the, is the only name out there. We don't have like multiple companies that produce this product. So they allow me to put a picture of Arista. So it is a, a power, a powder uh, uh, agent. It's quickly absorbed, absorbs in 48 hours. So it is like, it's less likely to ca cause a reaction um, or infection because it absorbs so quickly. It is the only agent that is some, approved for arterial bleed. So I thought that was cool. I didn't know that. Um, they, they do have uh, the laparoscopic applicators that you can uh, attach to this device and they are compatible with self-saver devices. Uh, so I went ahead and put a slide on self saver um, because that kind of prompt what else is compatible with self saver. So as you guys know, self savers is something that we would choose or patients would request when they decline uh, blood transfusions say from other people. They sometimes they will accept their own blood. So you use cell, uh, cell saver systems, which what they will do is clean the blood, filter it, wash it to allow retransfusion is if needed. Um, this could be done due to religious, uh, uh, re religious wishes or perhaps antibiotics, presence or other causes. Some of the contraindications or relative contraindications I found, you have amniotic fluid, and some of the topical agents, which are most of them that we will discuss today, like surgery cell, uh, surgery foam, Arista apparently is not one of them. Uh, a call or a hospital, you guys might already know that, and they do have the self saver system in the ORs. I've never seen it used, but we haven't. Um, and this other one, 
Uh, I never used this one either. It's made out of collagen. Evitane um, is a powder or a form. This bovine derive. Um, it absorbs in eight to 12 weeks, so it takes longer. One, I guess the prompt of this one is that it does not swell. Although it's a foam, it does not swell after implantation. So it was, it's not gonna cause delay compression in confined areas. And it's commonly used in, neuro, in neurosurgery. Okay, so some of the costs of this agents. So it starts just out quite expensive. Surgery powder, not as expensive. And then surgery foam, less expensive. So just by looking at that, uh, me and actually I was looking at this last week and Dr. Kramer was with me and he was surprised that surgery cell, the mesh was expensive that the powder, because that's the one that he would use the most. Uh, so just there's really no benefit whether you use the mesh or powder. So just by the cost, you know, it might be even be more cost effective use the powder. Um, but yeah. And now we're going to talk about some biological agents. Um, so the biological agents, they are, they are ideal for patients who have impaired coagulation cascade, for sure. Um, they are also associated, as we talked about, with blood-borne pathogens, could have allergic reactions. They're also much more expensive. Um, on this first one, that is the inpatients with a coagulation cascade, as we talked about before, these are patients that are on anticoagulation, um, yeah, some clotting disorder. And I was gonna say something else on that one. I forgot, let's keep going. Um, okay, so this is the coagulation cascade again. And the uh, products that we're gonna be talking about are thrombin products. So they are going to come in in the common pathway. And then you'll have uh, some of these products also will provide the fibrinogen. Um, and the first one that we will review is your topical thrombin. I was surprised that in this, in some of the research that I was doing, there were some case reports that people will put this IB. They are not IB, they are for topical thrombin. Um, this is just for topical use. And we have three common brand names. Uh, as you can see, the Recotrom, Evitrom, and this thrombin G. JMI. The one that we carry in the hospital, just so you know, is Recotron. I was not allowed to put the picture of it because there are some, I guess, multiple brand names for them. So I went ahead and drew a picture for you guys. So usually I feel like it is important. As the first and second year, I don't think I, I was able to see these agents much. Third and fourth year, most definitely. Uh, and that's in some ways, you're expected to know how to use them or how to put them together. And that could be tricky sometimes. So when you open the box of tropical thrombin, it will have, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but um, you guys, uh, you will have this applicator and the syringe and certainly the small vial. So what you do, you will take this little blue lid, you will pop it off you will add this applicator. It has a, like a needle, plastic needle, and you place it on top of your vial. Then you will hook your syringe to the other end of this applicator and just like pull it. Um, and how do you use it? Most of the time, certainly it's some people for what I was reading, you can add it once you have it on the syringe added to your surgical site. Um, or most commonly they will combine it with the another agent, not surgery cell, not uh, cellulose based because that's what deactivate these products, but most commonly uh, gelatin. Um, let's see. Um, some of the things that you need to, I guess, think about, I guess our hospital has Recotrom, other hospitals perhaps will carry a different one. With Evitrom, this one is the human uh, it's made of, it's a human product. So again, you will have to make sure your patient is aware of that. 
uh, with Recotron. One thing I did not know uh, that uh, these are not to be used in patients that have allergies to snake and hamsters. I surely never asked that, but there is that. And then Trombin GMI, that's the one that's made of a bovine derived. And this is the guy that can cause uh, antibody formations in uh, causing coagulopathy. So the first time the patient is exposed to this, you're basically, the patient is going to produce antibodies against factor five. I think, hold on. I think it was factor five light in and thrombin as well. So whenever your patient is re-exposed and the next surgery, factor five, yes, um, they can have catastrophic bleeding. Um, so they do, I've seen that in multiple papers. If you use this product, you must let your patients be aware that you use this product. So the next surgery, they perhaps will not use this product. Inflow seal. So again, at the next that we're going to talk about is flow seal and surgery seal. Um, this is a combination of bovine derived gelatin and human thrombin. It's liquid form, it's gelatin, like gooey stuff, and it's absorbed in four to six weeks uh, because it's liquid form. This is often used in areas that you cannot reach well, and they would just fill in the areas with this surgery flow or surgery cell, and it works really, it works great. It was like a charm. Again, I could not put a picture, but I'll draw you. Uh, I mean, you're drawing. So basically when you open the box, it will have the thrombin, uh, like the one that, we, that I just talked about. You will have the bio and the little applicator. So you can uh, draw the thrombin in one syringe. In another syringe, you will have the gelatin. So there was another applicator that you would put between the two syringes. And just, you probably, some of you guys have seen it used before. You just going into mix them go from syringe to syringe. And once this well, well mixed, um, you just put the applicator, this little blue um, applicator into the syringe and it's ready to go. There's, you, this is a product that is, kept at room temperature so that it's not, you don't have to thaw it or wait for it to be ready. You just have to prepare it. And that could take a couple, you know, a couple minutes. And it has also a laparoscopic applicator. So this also can be used um, in minimal invasive surgeries. And then again, it's commonly, commonly used in obstetrics and uh, gynecology surgeries. Um, one study that I did run into, it's this one, um, that these products are associated with increased risk, basically, of abscess, abscess uh, formations in women that underwent, underwent uh, pelvic surgery. I think this, this, this um, paper was published in 2014. Out of 14, the arm was a total of 413 women. They divided them in two groups. One of them got the... Uh, um, the gelatin thrombin matrix and the other one didn't. And they were just seeing who comes back with an abscess, basically. Um, and they gave us some criteria to how they identify the abscess. But basically, uh, 11 patients develop abscess. And out of those 11 patients were only the patients that uh, in the arm that was used with a, a gelatin thrombin. So 3% of the patients. And the location of the abscess was where the gelatin thrombin was um, noted in the open out description. So from all the, all the research that I've done, these guys are definitely the ones that carry the higher risk of um, absence formation, but they're also, there are some risk of, adhesions and bowel obstruction, some case reports with that one. So certainly caution using it, but it works like a charm when you do it. Um, then you have the fiber and sealants. Again, depending where you go, they have different names, different brand names, Tisil, Evisil, and Bistacil. Our hospital carries Bistacil. Um, it is, uh, uh, combines human derived thrombin with human but Brinachan, ideally, ideal for patients with coagulopathies. Um, 
Mm, it does need a little bit of time to thaw, so it has to be kept in the fridge. It takes 10 to 20 minutes to thaw, maybe closer to 10 minutes for what I've said before. Um, it is absorbed immediately. Um, certainly, you can use it for open cases and minimal invasive cases as well because it has a laparoscopic applicator that it can go through the five millimeter ports. And here's another one of my drawing, guys. Um, so this one, as I don't know if you can actually see, but inside, it, it is clear, like this whole thing here is clear. So you can see there are two syringes. One will have the trumpet and one will have the fibrinogen. So whenever you apply it, you hook this little applicator uh, and you just uh, push on the plunge. And then it, it was, it's going to combine blood, uh, both products, of course. Oh, and the cost of these agents. So Ricotrom, um, it's not too bad. And then you have the surgery flow because these are the products that we have in our hospital. And then we have Pistazil, which is a little bit more pricey. Okay. Um, another um, agent that we see, and I have never seen it used topically. Certainly we use it uh, PO for abnormal urine bleeding, or we can use it IB for our obstetrical uh, hemorrhage. But you can also use it topical, and apparently a lot of people do. Uh, you will mix it, um, or IB form, normally we give like one gram. So for topical, it's two grams. Um, and you can you mix it, either apply it directly or mix it with sterile water. Uh, the systemic absorption is going to be less than 10% of the IB form, and it's fairly cheap. So wait, hold on the picture. So uh, transemic acid is basically a lysine analog. And I know this one, I've seen it at least once in my pre-org exams. Um, and just basically what it's going to do once it binds to this lysine binding site is going to prevent plasma for breaking up the fibrinogen. So it's an antifibrinolytic uh, uh, product. And yes, so I also ran into this uh, uh, paper. So there was basically to use a topical transistemic acid, transistemic acid, um, and this one was at the time of elective C-section, C-section, uh, randomized study. It's actually pretty well described in the paper, um, but basically um, the estimated blood loss which much less uh, for patients that had a what they call the local group, which is the topical um, transistemic acid compared to the systemic one, which was the IB. Um, and also they did a post-op hemoglobin that also the topical one was showing a less of a drop in hemoglobin. Um, and they also did a study for abdominal hysterectomies comparing the IB and the topical forms. Um, and again, it was showing that the EVL with the topical forms was much less uh, intraoperably and post-op post as well. Post-op, they measure the amount of blood in a, in a drain. So they put a drain abdominally and they measure how much uh, blood was drained post-operably and that's what they um, included in their research. Um, we also have, I will mention some agents that we commonly use in vaginal and cervical surgery, and this mostly are your caustic agents. Um, you guys are probably well familiar with this because we commonly use them in the clinic, and we also use them for uh, vaginal surgeries in OR, mostly cervical um, but the first one is the uraferic sulfate, 20% uh, is the your famous Moncel's. Uh, these guys are very acidic. I didn't know, but the pH is approaching one. You also have silver natri nitrate and the zinc chloride paste. Again, mostly used for colposcopy and biopsies at the side, sleep, punch biopsies, um, cone biopsies. Um, a few words. 
And the Monsell solution, it, it was developed in 1852. Um, it is uh, believed that the way it works is by sealing the small vessels by agglutinating and precipitating proteins. Um, it is not associated with infection, perhaps because it is so acidic. Also, one thing that I did ran into, uh, if mon cells is used at the time of cervical biopsies, and it happens that you schedule this patient for a cone in less than three weeks from that biopsy, and you use mon cells, that could uh, impair the interpretation. Also, if you do a cervical biopsy and for some reason, your specimen gets stained with mon cells, you must let the pathologists know that because it can also impair your specimen. Oh, and one non-traditional use of mon cell that I will mention, and there are like a couple, two to three uh, case reports I've seen, but this is just one of them. Um, this was a patient, 23-year-old, um, 35 weeks, that presented a PPROM. She had a known placenta uh, posterior previa. Um, anyway, she went for the C-section. The placenta was delivered spontaneously, but after the, the placenta was delivered, they noted the hemorrhage from the placenta bed, mostly from the posterior side, so they thought... There is the focal accreta. Um, they they, they put, play some sutures. They gave her the methogen, the hemovate, or classic combo. Um, but it was not working. So they had gynonc in their service. So they called them in. So bottom line, what they end up doing, because this is a young person, so they didn't want to take her uterus out. They were trying to do all the things. They packed her uterus with 16 mils of mon cells impregnated in uterine, in a uterine pack, like a uterine packing. They did not specify how long they kept that, but it was just a few minutes. Um, it was not for a prolonged time. Um, and they did mention that the bleeding dramatically improved once they removed it. So they were able just to spray some uh, Ivisil, that's what they had in their hospital, uh, prophylactically to prevent uh, rebleeding from the placenta bed. Um, and they continued close to surgery. This patient was followed with a CT four months postpartum. There was no evidence of sequela uh, in a transvaginal ultrasound at 11 weeks postpartum, 11 months postpartum. And it was also unremarkable. Um, so, yeah, there is that. One, another agent that we have used only once, um, Dr. Ruddles and I, we used that knife float a couple of years ago, and I've never seen it again. Nobody apparently can find it, but this is used for moderate to severe bleeding, for sure. It's external use only. You don't use it for abdominal surgeries. Um, and um, mostly for cervical vaginal hemorrhage. This gas can remain up to 15 hours, but sometimes they have been recorded up to 48 hours. They are made out of, it's basically a plain gauze sucked in kaolin. Um, and it just promotes the coagulation by concentrating the number of platelets and clotting factors in the area. The patient that we use this, a couple of years ago, maybe had a Bartolin gland incision about two in the morning. Of course, it was, and she maybe was like 30 weeks pregnant. Um, she had a remarkable EBL. I think it was over a thousand. So we were running out of things and we, we used this gauze to pack um, the area for just a, like 30 minutes. And that significantly, significantly improved the bleeding. What else, guys? Oh, what is this? Okay, so this is just like, I have like two to three case reports that I found on this uh, quick clot. Um, um, anyway, so this, this cases came from a gynoc journal. 
So all of these are about abnormal pathology. It's like the first one, it was a TLH for complex CTP hyperplasia. Uh, this patient apparently was readmitted with a P. They restarted her on anticoagulation. And then on day six, she came in basically hemorrhaging uh, with the, from the posterior cuff. They initially packed her with uh, plain um, gauze and it was not helping. She was soaking them. So they packed her with this clot, a quick clot for 20 hours. At 20 hours, they removed it and lo and behold, stopped bleeding. Let's see. And case two is also, again, um, it was a, a delayed hemorrhage from a cervical cone. This was a patient that had a CKC for an abnormal uh, uh, biopsy. She came to the ED 12 hours later with vaginal bleeding. Uh, they attempted to pack her with Surgicel and a standard gauze, and it did not work. Um, so they packed her with this quick clot for 12 hours, and there was no additional episodes of bleeding. And lastly, uh, we have this obstetrical hemorrhage uh, patient that I know we, we've seen this before. Um, this was a patient that um, had a C-section for no rush for heart tracing, you know, and of course things go south at the C-sec, at the time of the C-section, uh, she had urine acne. They did all these things to back her at the bilinge demands. Um, and she went into the, uh, she ended up with a hysterectomy and shortly after that developed DIC. So on this paper, they did notice that um, after the closure of the vaginal cuff, they did notice that, noted the brisk bleeding vaginally. Um, they attempted to repair that, but because of DIC it was just not, not working well. So they packed her with quick clot and that was remaining for 12 hours and successfully uh, controlled the bleeding for this patient vaginally. One paper that I did run into, <laughs> I was surprised um, that in gynecological history, only about 15% operative reports correctly notes the usage of topical hemostatic agents. Um, so there is that. But this paper was like 12 years ago. So hopefully we've gotten better since then. And that's it. We're done. <laughs> um, yeah, if you guys have any questions. That was really good, Dr. Walker. And I would encourage everybody to look at that coagulation cascade. You really made it nice and simple. So it's thanks. Thank you. I really enjoyed all the drawings that you did, Jess. So thanks for that. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for uh, for Dr. Walker? I, I too enjoyed the, the drawings. <laughs> Very chalkboard like. Well, I know that when Intercede first came out, you know, all the REIs were very big in using it to try to it prevent adhesions. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I myself jumped on the bandwagon. I was never really completely impressed upon um, uh, how good it, how well it worked. Um, and in fact, one patient who we had done a myomectomy on, we had to take back to surgery because of a bowel obstruction. And lo and behold, at the nidus of the, uh, the bowel obstruction was the intercede. Uh, and that was the end of my use of intercede. So, um, you know, so, so these, these things do have some side effects if you're using it for, to prevent adhesions, for example. Anybody else? Okay. Well, excellent, excellent. Um, and, uh, you know, as Dr. Olson said, I think it's a good thing to kind of refresh your memory with the, the coagulation cascade because it does tend to make its way to standardized tests. Even, you know, Dr. Walker had even said that the, uh, um, the, uh, the one uh, picture that uh, she showed for the, uh, uh, thromboxane, uh, she found that on the, the creogs at least once. Um, so uh, it is something good to know. All right. Well, um, 
Thank you, Dr. Walker. Uh, so any, any questions, any comments before we move on to our, our next topic? I think we're a little early. The next topic's supposed to start at nine. Um, catastrophes? None? All right, well, um, would we like to take, uh, with the presenter's permission, would we like to take a five minute break for, for coffee? Yes, Dr. Rouse is shaking her head yes. Dr. Broadway is shaking her head yes, with two thumbs up. How about uh, a, like a 15 minute break? We'll start five minutes before nine. Okay, all right, we will be back. Everybody get your coffee.
Good morning, Dr. Rouse. Good morning. We've got just two super, super exciting topics. We've got vaginal discharge, super exciting. Um, and then malignancy and pregnancy. And that one actually is at least a little more interesting. Um, but those are the topics that we'll go over. I'll try to make some of them a little bit interactive in terms of the information presented. So um, I think when I was sharing my screen a minute ago, I couldn't see anybody. So please do speak up um, when you have an answer when there's a question. So let me share my screen. Let's see here. Well, I can't get my screen to shrink. All right, well, I'll just keep it as I have it. So uh, right now we've got vaginal discharge. This is the less exciting, obviously no new material. I've used the same presentation with very minor modifications over the last few years. So those of you who have been around long enough may actually know the answers before I get to them. Um, others hopefully will know the answers because they just know the answers. So the questions for this are based from pre quizzes that I don't believe are accessible anymore. Last time I tried to find them, I couldn't. And then the practice bulletin, it was last revised in 2020. So we're gonna first go through some of the pre questions. They come with a couple of so-so picture quality. Um, and then we're just gonna run through the practice bulletin and then give a summary of the recommendations. Um, there's a few points um, that we'll try to um, make sure is are clear in terms of some of our treatments or considerations on these patients. All right, so since I can see Morgan, can you read the uh, little paragraph and then give me your number one and number two answers? I think you're still muted. There you are. Sorry, we're trying to figure it out. Okay. Um, a 16 year old adolescent requests evaluation because of what she perceives as a profuse gray vaginal uh, discharge. She states that she notices the discharge, especially after sexual intercourse with her new boyfriend. She also mentions that the discharge has a fishy odor, which um, is accentuated by intercourse. Her last period was two weeks ago. She and her partner are using condoms for contraception. Physical examination confirms the presence of thin, gray, slightly frothy vaginal discharge, no cervical tenderness or exudate is noted. The vaginal pH is 4.5. Saline microscopy shows very few lactobacilli, many small um, cocci and bacilli and epithelial cells with borders that are indistinct because they studded with bacteria. Which of the following microorganisms is least likely to be responsible for this infection? Um, least likely, I would say chlamydia. Okay, and what about question number two? Um, what is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? So, uh, metronidazole. Very good, you got them all right. Um, so just in summary, remember that um, BV or bacterial vaginosis is oftentimes multi organ or uh, multi multiple organisms, excuse me. So we are familiar with Gardnella, but that, that's what the other ones listed are. So it's mostly your anaerobes. Um, and then that profuse discharge fishy odor is what you'll hear, tends to be uh, accentuated after intercourse. If you add your potassium hydroxide, if you're doing your own uh, wet prep, you'll get that uh, amine or whiff test. Um, remember pH for the vagina is normally four and a half or greater. You may see a decrease in lactobacilli in the background if you're really paying attention. And correct, you got metronidazole. So typically you do the 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Um, if you opted for vaginal treatment, Morgan, what metronidazole concoction formulation dosing, how would you recommend it? 
I'm sorry, how would I recommend it? Like, like, no, how, would like I, how, how would you write your prescription for Metrogel? Um, I believe it's the 0.75 percentage um, percent um, Metrogel um, per vagina uh, before bed um, times seven days. Very good. Almost got it exact, which it, the only thing you got wrong is it's for five instead of seven. Um, but do you realize, especially if your patient's an older patient um, or if they have history of nausea, vomiting with the metronidazole, um, you could decrease or change the dosing or use the metrogel, but it is a lot more expensive if you're trying to be cost effective, if it's uh, from a coverage perspective for your patients, if they're insured or not. Very good. All right. I see Natalie on my screen as well. Natalie, do you want to go through this one? Sure. Um, an 18 year old sexually active Nola Paris woman presents to her physician's office for evaluation of dysuria and vaginal discharge. Physical exam reveals a purulent discharge in the endocervical os. See figure one. Yeah, not the greatest quality, but there you go. All right. <laughs> so you get three questions. Oh, goody. Um, which of the following <laughs> organisms is most likely to be associated with clinical findings? Um, honestly, I was thinking gonorrhea, so I'm going to pick chlamydia C. Okay. So keep going. You got question two and three still. Okay. Which of the following is the best initial test for confirmation? Um, nucleic acid. And then which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? I would pick azithro. And you got it right. Awesome. Very good. So the explanation that they like to go through. So the picture is supposed to be that muc mucopurulent cervicitis. And yes, I agree that gonorrhea is in the differential and is more likely to have issues or more symptoms than chlamydia. That's why the recommendation is you're screening for both of them for all your patients under 25 or sexually active when you look at the CDC guidelines. Um, and then chlamydia can also create UTI symptoms because it could give you a urethral infection, proctitis, PID, and of course, everyone remembers Fitzhugh Curtis. We like to talk about that as well. Um, if it's an uncomplicated chlamydial infection, you can do the azithromycin, they say powder, but tablets or capsules is what we use. Um, and then you've got alternatives listed, but because they're multi-dose, they may not be as compliant. Um, and then remember the CDC recommends if you identify one, you treat for both uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea. All right, let's see who else is in my pictures. Jennifer, Jen, if you could go through this one, this one's yours. A 22 year old nulligravid female requests evaluation because of vaginal burning, dysuria, malodorous discharge. She also has noticed a slight amount of postcoital bleeding she has only had one sexual partner, her boyfriend of six months. The couple had sexual intercourse two days ago and did not use any method of contraception. On physical exam, you notice mild erythema of the vulva, frothy green discharge, the vaginal pH is 4.5, and the mean test is positive. Her cervical cytology smear is shown in the photograph. Y'all see the picture? All right, here's your two questions to go with this one. What other physical examination findings may be caused by the organism shown in the photograph? Um, I pick A, punctate lesions on the cervix. Which of the following is the most appropriate management for this patient? Um, let's see. Okay, so they both need to take metronidazole. See, they need to do B. Correct. So this was obviously trichomonas and it's a protozoan. So you get that classic question, frothy green discharge. You may have some inflammation and erythema and there's your strawberry cervix. So it's that punctate hemorrhages of the cervix and the treatment is a one-time dose. Um, but again, uh, nausea vomiting sometimes is an issue. So 500 BID for seven days is a reasonable alternative and they're recommending no sexual activity for seven days after treatment until both have completed their treatment. And don't forget that once you have um, trichomonas itself, it doesn't cause, um, it doesn't cause um, 
significant risk by itself, but if you have trichomonas and you're exposed to HIV specifically, it definitely can increase your risk of acquiring the HIV. And yes, Brooke, you were correct. They are discouraging the one-time dose only because of the fact that most of them don't keep it down. And it's inexpensive and twice daily it, for a week is sufficient for treatment. All right, so next person on my list is Emily. Um, it still says log on your screen. You might wanna update your screen. <laughs> this one's yours. It's yours. Thanks. Um, I think I did at one point, it just went back, but I'll investigate. Um, an 18 year old nulliparous woman has been sexually active for one year. She has had four partners during this time period. She requests an evaluation because of increased vaginal discharge that began approximately 10 days after contact with her newest sexual partner. On physical exam, there is a profuse greenish yellow discharge uh, emanating from an obviously inflamed vaginal mucosa. Please see photograph. Multiple punctate hemorrhages are present on the exocervix. The amine whiff test is negative. So the color obviously didn't cross over well, but I literally copied and pasted it directly from their website. So that to me looks white, maybe gray, but I don't see any green or yellow, but that's what they claim we're supposed to see. All right, you get three questions. Um, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Um, say trick which of the following is the most likely vaginal ph um i believe with trick it is morris it's the it's 4.5 or greater than 4.5 and then which is the most cost effective um for confirming cost effective would be a uh, saline microscopy assume. All right, you get two more questions. You get the one that has all the questions. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> which of the following is the most appropriate treatment for this patient? Um, for trick we use metronidazole, and then which of the following is not indicated? Um, I'm going to say D. I'm honestly not sure. Herpes. You did fabulous. You got them all right. Yeah. And the reason it's D is because that's the only one the CDC doesn't recommend screening for. So 25% of cases of vaginitis, vaginitis are going to be associated with trichomoniasis is what they're saying. I mean, I don't think we see it that much. I know Dr. Wood did a study um, a couple of years ago and found in our OB patient population, I think is what he looked at. Um, it was like a 1% incidence rate. So there was no point to screening everybody since we had such a low incidence rate. So depending on where you're working, uh, prevalences may vary and your screening may vary uh, versus just waiting till they're symptomatic. Um, again, they'll tell you about the yellow green, maybe slightly malodorous, uh, inflamed vaginal mucosa. You get the strawberry cervix pH again, typically four and a half or greater. Often you'll get the negative whiff test, but don't forget, not every patient follows textbooks. They may also have other issues going on, um, including a co-infection or um, also finding of either bacterial vaginosis or, or yeast. If you look at them, if you find them in the clinic and you are doing your saline microscopy, go find a friend who might not have seen it to share it um, because it is kind of cool to see. And if you're going to be STD screening, my theory is if you're exposed to one, that means you're exposed to all. So if you're testing and confirm you're, you're positive for one, you might as well go ahead and get screened for all of them. Um, and then again, herpes screening is not very helpful. Metronidazole is it. Single dose they've talked about, but again, like we talked about 500 twice daily for a week is probably better um, from a tolerance perspective. If you have someone who really does have significant nausea or they're very, very thin and petite or like some of your uh, older patient population, because they are sexually active too, the 250 milligram dose three times a day instead may be an alternative um, and make sure their partner's treated as we discussed previously. All right, so this is where we're going to go over just a couple of the practice bulletin points. So vaginitis is many symptoms and it can, um, many conditions, excuse me, that can be associated with multiple uh, symptoms, some of which may overlap with other conditions, such as they may report burning or dysuria, and it's kind of hard to know, is it vaginal or is it vulvar or is it urinary? 
Um, the most common causes are going to be the common ones that we deal with. So BV, candida, trichomonas, and then the undiagnosed. And I love how they give this 7 to 72% of symptomatic women. I mean, it just sounds like you might need to retest or use a better test. So vaginitis technically is inflammation or, in, or infection of the vagina. Um, you can get that fishy odor. You can get abnormal other odor. You may have abnormal discharge complaints. Um, and these are the, you all have seen it. It's one of the most common symptoms or reasons that people will come to the office or call to the office or drop into triage. I've had this problem for three weeks and decided today, Friday night was the best time to come to labor and delivery rather than call the office. Y'all know those patients. Um, <clears throat> and uh, make sure that we're um, treating, they're talking about evidence-based medicine. So they've got us information in this article, primarily for the non-pregnant. So in the undiagnosed group, there could be lots of symptoms. And there's, because there's so many differential diagnoses that go with these symptoms, um, you definitely want to make sure that you have an accurate diagnosis. So not a patient self-diagnosis. All right, next one on my list is Van Buren. Your question. Fill in the blanks. Okay, so... Blank status plays a crucial role in determining the normal state of the vagina. This is very open-ended. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's a hormone. Oh, estrogen. And keep reading. You got one more blank. During the reproductive years, the presence of blank increases glycogen content in vaginal epithelial cells. Also estrogen. Mm -hmm. which that encourages colonization of the vagina by lactobacilli. This increased level of colonization leads to lactic acid production and a resulting decrease in the vaginal pH to less than 4.7. Very good. And just remember, um, as patients go through menopause or before they hit puberty, the epithelium is thinner and the pH is usually greater than or at 4.7. So just something to keep in mind. So an increase in the colonization of the vagina by lactobacilli is what we like. This leads to a decrease in vaginal pH. The acidic environment protects against the growth of the pathogenic ones. So maintaining uh, a balanced uh, ecosystem is what they're recommending. All right, I got Benton. True or false? Normal vaginal flora is heterogeneous, and you can find all these things. True. Correct. You got an easy one. Let's. You'll get the next one as well. So just keep in mind, uh, when you're doing an evaluation, you should have these things evaluated or at least asked, um, what is the change in the discharge? Is there odor, itch, burn, irritation, swelling, dyspareunia, dysuria associated with the complaint? The focus history should also include information about their sexual history. So don't forget to ask about types of partners, number of partners and what they're doing. Um, and then what have they used over the counter or been prescribed, you know, cause a lot of urgent cares don't even do an exam. They're like, oh, you have those symptoms. Here you go. Here's some diflucan. Here's some metronidazole. And they've never even had the patient undress. Also, don't forget to talk about hygiene practices. Um, shaving, maybe not as much, but the douching practice, depending on what they're using, could also significantly change your pH. Do they have other comorbidities? So are they diabetic, especially those who... Uh, maybe using the medications that are helping clear their glucose through their urine. They're definitely at higher risk for candidal infections of the genital urinary area. Um, are they immunocompromised significantly? So HIV patients and then inflammatory bowel disease. And that's more related to some of the immunosuppressants they may be using. And then also if they're still having cycles, asking them, are there changes with their menstrual cycle or is it independent? Obviously, you want to ask where the symptoms are, how long they've been going on, how are they related to their cycle, what they've used in the past or what they've used on their own. Um, and again, sexual history, do they have a new partner, change in practices, whatnot. <coughs> Excuse me. Most patients will have some sort of vaginal infection will also have vulvar uh, symptoms or manifestations. So you want to definitely do an exam where you're looking at the external as well as the internal. Obviously, if you're going to be doing an exam, you're going to look for vaginal pH, you're going to do your WIF test, you're going to do your wet mount um, using your saline, and then you're going to do your KOH. Um, a lot of these things um, may be changed now. 
Oh, my dog's going crazy. Sorry. Um, a lot of these things maybe change because in the clinic, I don't see y'all doing wet mounts and KOHs very often anymore where everybody seems to be doing a DNA probe and that is totally fine. And if you're there looking for BV yeast, don't forget to consider um, trichomonas um, as well as gonorrhea and chlamydia screening if deemed appropriate based on their history um, as part of their evaluation. So here is a nice little summary table that you can easily find in the practice bulletin if you're interested. So it gives you the basic conditions. So here they are, symptoms and discharge. So when you look at these here, the, this column with the symptoms and discharge is usually what you're gonna see on your creogs and your testing. What you find is typically going to somewhat reflect that. So again, that's gonna be your common descriptors in your paragraphs. The pH is where you wanna uh, look at because they do like to stick with very clear cut pH of they'll say like 4.8. So it really clearly tells you it's this option or this option. And it's not normal or candida. They don't do the mixed um, uh, options. And then they give you the basic findings here. But again, when you go back to you studying, when it comes to CREOGS, you want to look at your pH values for each of your infections and how they describe the classic um, findings. All right, so candida, so it could be inflammation infection. It's the second most common cause of vaginitis. Up to half of women report at least one episode in their lifetime. It could be asymptomatic con uh, colonization where you look, you see it, it may be reported even on a PAP report, but they never complained, you don't need to treat. But you may have the extreme and you have patients with severe symptoms. I had one that um, she had hygiene issues due to her mental health status. And we took her to the operating room because the thought was she probably has vulvar cancer um, because the extent of her infection was so bad. But when we got to the operating room and we can get a good exam because she wouldn't let us do a good exam in the office, it was very clear. It was the worst case of yeast I'd ever seen in my life. And it took quite a long time of both topical and systemic treatment to resolve it. Um, so you want to have one of two things. You see your spores, your pseudo hyphae or hyphae on your wet mount, um, or you could do a culture or one of the commercial tests. So for example, we use the DNA probe. 90% of your cases are going to be albicans and they're going to usually respond to your azoles. So things like your fluconazole, um, cultures can be helpful though, if you have resistant or recurrent disease. Um, if you have a diabetic patient, then that may be related more to their diabetes and or medications used to treat their diabetes. But anyone who's non-diabetic should be in your consideration if you've had it. Because if you find that you have glabrata instead, it does not respond uh, to treatment, at least not the typical treatment. So the recommendations or uh, categories that they're saying, so you've got uncomplicated and then you're complicated. So uncomplicated is the obvious. So complicated is going to be recurrent. Recurrent in their definition is four more a year. So four more proven, not symptoms from a patient. Severe symptoms or findings you've shown or suspect that it's something other than albicans and then patients with comorbidities or they say pregnancy. So here's your obvious choices for treatment. And again, you'll be able to go back to this later. So uncomplicated and most of this stuff is actually over the counter. So patients can start with over the counter and your meconazole is your nystatin that does come in a vaginal tablet um, as an option. And then you've got your fluconazole. We all know patients will tell us they don't like the messy um, over the counter suppositories. Um, so that's what their preference is. But again, a lot of over the counters don't need to have um, prescriptions. And this is their summary of that. So again, it's in the practice bulletin. I just kind of broke it out. So when they talk, when they evaluated or randomized severe vulvovaginal candidiasis, they found that if you gave someone a second dose, so our usual 150 one-time dose, a second time three days later, they found that they improved the cure rate to 80%. So is it statistically significant? Maybe not. But if you've got that patient who's still reporting symptoms or it's a recurrent episode, it may be worthwhile to consider. So if you have therapy for seven to 14 days, um, for those who have recurrent disease, um, you may want to consider some sort of prophylaxis up to six months, so weekly, um, and that'll control the majority of your patients 
uh, in that situation or in that setting. Um, it is less risk of doing fluconazole weekly than in considering ketoconazole um, from the standpoint of liver toxicity. And those who can't or won't or can't afford it, um, you could do the clotrimazole weekly um, or twice weekly, depending on your dosing. So again, if you have these patients, you're going to look this up. So again, candida glabrata is going to be less common, but it does occur. Um, and it's only 50% effective. And what you'll find is that when you read the literature, some of the medication options to treat glabrata are quite a bit more expensive um, in terms of the antifungal category. And they also uh, interact with a lot of other medications your patient may be on, and they're expensive. So you can try a prolonged course of your um, fluconazole or less expensive and easier to tolerate um, is your vaginal boric acid. Um, these have to be compounded though. So it has to go to a compounding pharmacy. Um, but usually a 14 day supply out of pocket is about 40 bucks. So for someone who doesn't have insurance coverage, that is probably uh, more cost effective than some of the other options. Um, however, boric acid can be fatal if inject ingested orally. So you got to make sure your patients are aware of that risk. Um, I used to just odd fact, it turns out it comes in a big bright yellow bottle at the home improvement stores. And if you don't have kids or pets, you can use that around the corners of your house. And it's one of the best or most effective uh, treatments for roaches. I learned this when I lived in Miami where they have roaches in apartment buildings. Um, yeah, I know pretty gross but it works really, really well. Um, and it doesn't have an odor to it like a bug spray would. It tends to be effective longer, but you can't have kids or pets uh, exposed to it, but um, very toxic. But you can still buy it dirt cheap, like in the home improvement stores. All right, so bacterial vaginosis. So they list clindamycin orally as an option, but that's not typically very effective, um, but vaginal dosing, so your cream, your sustained cream, um, and your ovules will be more effective. And then you have your metronidazole gel and your oral. And this is the one that was correctly described, um, but it is a five day instead of seven day treatment. And there's your summary table again, once again. So BV, again, we talked about already. So uh, the practice bulletin is just summarizing it, restating the fact for us that it's polymicrobial. So lack of hydrogen peroxidase, that's uh, producing lactobacilli. So you have an overgrowth of your anaerobes. Um, and because they're part of your normal flora, um, just because they're present doesn't mean you have BV. It, the patient needs to be symptomatic. And these are the species that you're going to see included in that list. Uh, Dr. So it's not really, I'm sorry. Question. It, the, uh, the, the, the roaches in Florida, uh, and no offense to any Floridians, but um, is that not what they refer to as June bugs? I don't know. We never called them that. Oh, okay. Well, when, when I mean, we had palmetto, we had palmetto bugs, which look like roaches and they may be in the roach family, but they lived in the palmetto palms and they flew. So you can have flying bugs that look like roaches is pretty gross, but usually those were not in your house. They just got in your house by accident when you opened the doors, but roaches were roaches and they were gross. Uh, I never had them in the house. We had them in when I lived in apartments. So you, you powdered things down well. Gotcha. All right. So BV, again, not a true infectious or inflammatory state because, again, it's just going to be overgrowth of what's already there. Um, so they're stating the same thing over. It's going to be the most common cause of abnormal discharge complaints. So BV is going to be your most common complaint for visits. Um, when you look at how it's distributed amongst our patient population, it's going to be more common in our uh, African-American, Hispanic, and Mexican-American women compared to Caucasian or non-Hispanic women. Um, things that may change your pH or uh, just the um, balance of your flora would be patient age. So that's kind of, are they pre um, reproductive age, or postmenopausal, whether they're douching or not, how often they're sexually active. Are they using condoms with spermicides or not? That may also be changing pHs. And it is not considered to be sexually transmissible, at least not of any one pathogen for this diagnosis. All right, test questions. So these are important because you will be asked, what is AMSIL's criteria? Well, here it is. You need three out of the four. So the gray discharge, your pH is elevated. You have the positive amine or WIF test. 
And then more than 20% of your epithelial cells are clue cells. You have a pretty good sensitivity and specificity. Um, but if you only use two of the criteria, so let's say you want to skip the, I don't want to smell anything, you still would do pretty good. Um, studies um, regarding tests are fine. They're all reasonably well. However, most tests are one organism limited. We're doing the multiplex testing. So that's our DNA probe. Um, and that's comparable to the gold standard. Um, and of course, it can test you for trick and candida. One thing of note, just as a side note related to that, there are some insurances that are not very keen on paying anything. And so you might do a DNA probe because your patient complains of discharge or clinical suspicion, it's probably BV. Your test looks for BV, but your test is also looking for candida and trichomonas. And the way that they bill it, it unbundles the test and it says it won't pay for the component of the test that checked for trichomonas and candida because you didn't have diagnosis codes to go with those. Fun times. Um, don't forget, um, you can have a higher incidence or risk of PID um, infections relating to timing around surgery. Um, and then if you have BV, there's thought you may have a higher risk of acquiring HIV or herpes. Um, there's studies to show that if you treat for BV, so you've identified it, not presumptively, but you've identified it prior to an abortion or a hysterectomy, you will decrease their post-op infection risk. Um, and then the treatment of asymptomatic BV is unclear. And that's more discussed, I think, in our OB patient population. Um, and once you treat it for the symptomatic BV, it may recur in up to a third of women within three months. There's also associations of low birth weight, premature rupture of membranes and prematurity. Um, you could treat BV in pregnant women who are symptomatic, but again, treating asymptomatic BV you found by accident uh, is not recommended at this time. We've talked about the up to 30% will recur in three months and more than half within 12 months of treatment. Um, so that could again, go back to behavioral and lifestyle choices um, for that patient population. And if you have, so the numbers vary. So with Canada, it was four times. BV is three times. So if you have three documented episodes in a year, then that's considered recurrent BV. Um, so you can offer twice weekly suppressive metronidazole gel for 16 weeks, um, or you can change how you dose it to begin with for treatment. And here's your medications. If you have a patient who doesn't tolerate this, um, you can try the tinidazole as well. And again, back to the same thing. So when you go to study, this practice bulletin really does have, I would say, go to the tables more so than just read through all the materials since we've summarized it. All right, last topic is your trichomonas. That's your um, most common non-viral STD in the U.S. They talk up to 5 million cases annually. And of course, there's disparities like everything else. They seem to find it more in the African-American women compared to the non-Hispanic white. Um, and it's more common in women of any uh, ethnic background that have more sexual partners, a lower socioeconomic status, and those who douche. And it is too associated with PID, cuff cellulitis post hysterectomy, uh, HIV risk, and other STDs. And more than half the patients with trichomonas are symptomatic. But then again, the symptoms may be minimal and you kind of think, oh, it's just BV. Um, but it is commonly sexually transmitted. Um, you can have all these different symptoms. The one that typically I think is the most pronounced, um, more so than the complaints of discharge, because those can be minimal, is the postcoital bleeding. There's always two things you should be thinking about postcoital bleeding um, would be trichomonas, and the other is when was your last pap smear? In my mind, those are the first two things I always want to think about for postcoital bleeding. I'm thinking cervical cancers and I'm thinking trick as being my most common because they cause uh, uh, increased friability of your uh, cervical surface. You usually get that pH elevation. And again, you're going to see them on saline microscopy. So again, if you find them in the, in the clinic, go find a friend, see if they've seen it before or recently. And, and if anything, we've got so many new nursing. Um, it's also something nice to share with some of the new, new uh, staff that we've got because they get excited when they get to learn something new. Um, and that's one of those that kind of like a fun fact. And then um, they start telling you some horror stories. It's always wonderful uh, discussions that go from there. Anyway, if you're doing your NAT test, um, it is a little bit more uh, sensitive and specific. You can do other 
um, commercial tests. So again, in our office, we're using our DNA probes. Wet mount, surprisingly, is very low sensitivity. Um, culture techniques, very sensitive, point of care tests. So this will be kind of where we're at. And again, you can still have side effects with our medication. So remind them not to have any alcohol. So patients will tell you, but I took my metronidazole. I took my flagell. Why do you have trichomonas again? And then they'll tell you they haven't been sexually active since you saw them last. Well, resistance is actually quite low. Um, only about 5% are resistant. And most of the time when you're looking at it, it may just be compliance. They didn't take their medication or more or and or um, their partner didn't get treated and or they've been reinfected because of exposure. Um, and then from a pregnancy perspective, this one is not recommended in pregnancy. Use your metronidazole. Self-diagnosis. We get a lot of these phone calls. I, I get these messages frequently. I have bacterial vaginosis again because of my symptoms. Can I have a refill on my flagell? Mm, no, not necessarily. The symptoms are so nonspecific. Risks of medication, cost of medication um, can be a problem. So you definitely want to make sure that you evaluate the patient in person to make sure that you're treating, you're diagnosing the correct thing and you're treating the correct thing. Pap smears are not reliable. So when you see findings on there that there might be BV, Canada, or TRIC on your pap smear, the recommendation is you should bring them back in for repeat testing if they were symptomatic. Or if you find trichomonas, you want to do the more confirmatory test that has a better sensitivity. And then the use of probiotics and other therapies are not recommended, but you will hear patients telling you how they're doing all these things. So oral or vaginal lactobacilli are not effective. Um, and anything that's commercially available is not FDA regulated, but you'll hear people tell you they've used yogurt. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to yogurt. It's a good, as long as they pick the lower sugar versions, I mean, it's a good source of calcium and protein and whatnot. Garlic, I mean, I don't see anything wrong with garlic. Tea tree oil, that seems a little odd to be using or ingesting. A low carb diet, well, for your diabetic, that may actually be a reasonable choice, but is it going to help this? Maybe not, but it may have other benefits. And do, douching as well, insufficient data on the effect, efficacy. So don't forget, atrophic vaginitis kind of falls into this category as well. They may have a variety of complaints. Obviously, this is going to be in your postmenopausal women or your women who are maybe on some sort of therapies that essentially put them into menopause, like your prolonged Lupron use. You'll have a, VA, a pH change. So again, that's what you're looking for. Your mean test will be negative. So again, you're not going to have BV smell. Um, and you're going to try first line would be your water-based um, moisturizers or maybe topical estrogens if appropriate. This is the weird one that you sometimes just can't find a cause. So it falls into that first slide that we had for this practice bulletin. Seven to 72% have no known diagnoses. Well, it may be process of elimination. It's this, desquamative inflammatory, inflammatory vaginitis. It's usually the perimenopausal, postmenopausal women. They'll have all the same complaints of all the other things. So again, nonspecific. You can't just treat based on history or what you might see on exam. Um, the pH will be a little elevated and the test again will be negative. You'll see a lot of PMNs and parabasal cells if you look um, under the microscope. And generally, you'll still treat 14-day um, course with the clindamycin cream, but again, they tend to relapse. All right, so let's see, where did we, I think Brooke was the last one on my list. So where do I have, who else is here? Well, I think that gets everybody. So I guess we'll, at the top now, I've got Jen again. So Jen, you're it, true or false? Eucoperiolent cervicitis, which is sometimes caused by gonorrhea or chlamydia, may present as abnormal yellow discharge. Is this like separate questions? May see periolent discharge, cervical friability symptoms suggested a PID leukocytosis on microscopy. Are these two separate things? Thank yes. <laughs> I yes. just gave you an answer because I was clicking on the chat box. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure I was supposed to Let me back up. So, separately. Yeah, so, so um, the cervicitis you might see from gonorrhea or chlamydia may present as yellow discharge. So that was that picture question we had earlier. So they can look similar. Um, and then you might have cervical friability. So maybe not necessarily a strawberry cervix, but you touch it and it bleeds. So now you're thinking, oh, what else is going on? You might see white cells when you're looking under the microscope with your wet prep. So it is true. 
All right, so AMSO criteria or gram stain recommended for diagnosis of BV. You can do the metronidazole. You can do the intravaginal clindamycin. Um, there's a few others. This is one of the newer drugs. It's not as well covered by insurances, but it is a one-time dose. I know I've had a few patients try it and they just didn't like the taste of it. They said it was pretty awful. All right, so your next level of recommendations. So do your more specific nucle nucleotide amplification. You can try your metronidazole for treating your trichomonas. Next level, um, you need to make sure that you see the spores, the pseudohyphae or, or hyphae on wet mount, or you have a culture that confirms it to treat and then extended treatment for those with recurrent. And remember recurrent for Canada, they say is four episodes that were documented within a year and BV is three episodes. Um, if you uh, treat patients for trichomonas, they're recommending, again, lower level recommendation though, that you should probably retest them within three months. So the hope is, is that they've got some reason be coming in for follow-up. So you can just do it at that time. For example, if you started a contraceptive um, or had other concerns or testing that was needed, pap smears again are not reliable. So you want to make sure that you follow it up if it's important, um, get a good history um, and make sure you evaluate the patient in person. And then fluconazole would be your uncomplicated candida first line, typically treatment. Self-diagnosis, not recommended. Probiotics and other things are not recommended as, as prevention or treatment. And if trichomonas is confirmed, then you definitely want to um, go ahead and get treatment. That is the end. That was just way too exciting, I know. Um, but that gives us a nice good break. So the next one's a little bit longer. It's going to be malignant disease and pregnancy. So my watch, my watch says 9.37. So why don't we shoot for 9.50 as a start so we have more time later. Sound good? Dr. Ross, I had a question. Uh-huh. Um, sorry, are you muted? Okay. Um, so for the PAP and seeing these organisms, so sure, um, Canada, BV, I get that. But if you see trick, I mean, would you ever have trick on a PAP without actually having an infection? Like, I, I just feel like you're, you're putting your patient through an unnecessary exam because it's something that's not supposed to be there. Right. So you can go ahead and offer to treat, but you may also have a patient who you weren't expecting to find it on. And that's why you only see it on the PAP and you didn't do a test at the time. So it may be worthwhile to bring the patient in to retest to confirm it's a true diagnosis. But yes, you don't want to delay treatment, but you also want to have correct treatment. So for example, you have a patient you've seen for five or six years coming into the clinic. She reports she's been married for a long time, has no complaints, just it's time for her PAP. And then you find this on the PAP smear. I think I would want to have her come in for a repeat test to confirm if it's a real diagnosis or not, because it's, you want the more specific um, uh, and sensitive test to confirm it. Um, because remember with pap smear screening, you are going to have some artifacts and stuff. And I mean, honestly, at that point you start questioning, okay, who, who is the one who is bringing this to the relationship? You don't want to get in the middle of all that. So you just want the more confirmatory test to say that. But you hope is that you're testing people if they're reporting symptoms or you have suspicion clinically at the time of the pap smear. So you have the other tests, but often you won't. But you would start treatment even in that patient if you saw a trick on a pap? I would talk to them, but yes, uh, I think that would be very reasonable. Okay. I think they want you more to avoid, not to rely on the pap smear to diagnose your trick. So if you have clinical suspicion for trichomonas, do not do just a pap do the confirmatory or better test. And then if you find yeast or BV, if they were asymptomatic, then you do not use that to treat, you just ignore it and move on. And if they were symptomatic, you had another test done at the time of the PAP. You don't use the PAP as your, I'm gonna treat you. So if, when you review all your PAP reports and they all say that there's a shift in flora suggestive of bacterial vaginosis, you don't just reflex, everybody gets metronidazole. You make sure that if they were symptomatic, you had tested them and look at the more specific and sensitive test for your treatment. But there are people who will treat every suggested BV on their pap smear just to treat them. All right, so 
9.50, so 10 minutes.
What do you all have at 11? Self-directed learning. Okay, good. I have a very extensive attorney meeting that I'm not looking <laughs> forward to. In the long run, it saves you money. I know. I, I think we made a mistake, though. If she's making that much an hour, I should have a side gig. <laughs> All right, we've got our last topic to cover, and this is malignant disease in pregnancy. All right. So there's lots of different things. There's certain types of cancers that you're going to hear about more. So I have created fictional cases and we're going to use those fictional cases to review most commonly identified malignancies in pregnancy. And we'll touch briefly on chemotherapy and radiotherapy, chemotherapy specifically listing the key. You'll see it on your uh, tests, but also in clinical practice, um, some of the side effects and long-term side effects or risks. All right. So first one, Miss Linda Jones, you are in the office today and you are seeing her as a confirmation of pregnancy visit. She's 39. This is her first pregnancy. And she came in because her positive test was at home in the last two weeks. No bleeding, cramping, discharge complaints, some nausea, but has only vomited twice, so doesn't think she needs anything yet. Um, she's constipated, has some bloating. You go through your review systems. You also find she reports fatigue, urgency, frequency, and some breast tenderness, all the things we would kind of expect. And she's lost about five pounds in the last two weeks because her appetite's poor. She says that um, she, again, still doesn't think she needs anything. So not very much out of the ordinary. You go through her history and you find she has known fibrocystic breast disease. Um, she had lymphoma that was treated as a teenager. She's had a biopsy in the past, which is how she had her breast disease confirmed. Um, she had knee arthroscopy and a tonsillectomy. She's married. She quit smoking when she found out her pregnancy test was positive. Previously, she'd been smoking at least half a pack since a very young age. Um, she does have history of social alcohol, but no drug use. She's working as an x-ray technician. She's not exercising regularly, but tells you pushing that big x-ray machine around is more than enough exercise. Family history wise, you have some cervical cancer, thyroid cancer, breast cancer, hypertension, diabetes, and skin cancer. Nothing too horribly significant or exciting yet. Her OBGYN history. So she started cycles young. They are a bit irregular. She'll have them every month to two months plus, and they usually last five to seven days. She has used pills in the past intermittently um, for a total of at least 10 years lifetime, uh, mostly for cycle control, but for periods of time for contraception. She's never had any abnormal PAPs, infections. She denies any history of dyspareunia or abuse. She's been sexually active with men only, three lifetime partners starting at age 16. Here's her vitals. So, Normal range, but upper end of it, blood pressure, uh, BMI is 39. Pregnancy test, of course, was positive. Her urine analysis was negative. On physical exam, you're not finding anything exciting. You did a pap smear and gonorrhea and chlamydia since she hadn't had any in a while and was due for them. And here's your breast exam. Symmetric, diffusely tender, which goes along with pregnancy. She has bilateral fibrocystic changes that you can palpate on exam, and um, that's something Thing you expected based on her history. You don't see any skin changes. She doesn't have any nipple discharge, but you feel an area on the right breast that is in the upper outer quadrant. It's kind of irregular, poorly defined, feels kind of firm, doesn't really move. It's about four centimeters from the areola and it's about two to three centimeters in diameter. So it kind of gets your attention. So from a pregnancy perspective, Van Buren, what's our next steps? What would do we want to do for her from a pregnancy perspective? Like just regular prenatal care stuff? Yep. So what would those things be? Um, so we're going to go ahead and get her prenatal labs. Um, we're going to go ahead and get a dating ultrasound. We're going to um, do, I mean, have her start a prenatal vitamin, have her do all of the stuff that we typically do at our confirmation of pregnancies. Um, we, de I mean, we've already kind of pretty well we do a lot of first trimester counseling as far as you know diet and exercise and weight gain and um, all of the things that we talk about at that first visit excellent 
so you got all of it. Don't forget to talk about screening options. So she is 39, so you've got that extra AMA counseling. Don't forget you want to talk about your vaccination history because you'll want to, we'll just screen for rubella, but you may want to screen for um, varicella if there's no known history of vaccination or disease. We already talked about the ultrasound. You're going to do all the teaching. And then again, you're going to talk about her pregnancy risk. So advanced maternal age is her big one, but that may also lead to diabetes, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Her BMI is 39, so you may consider early glucose screening. But don't forget, we need a mammogram. It is safe in pregnancy. Um, and if they're less than 30 to 35 years of age, the breast tissue is probably too dense for a mammogram to be very valuable. So if they're past the first trimester, you might wanna opt for an MRI as an alternative. Um, the number of cases of breast cancer diagnosed during pregnancy or affected, uh, affecting pregnancy is actually pretty low. But we've had runs in the past where it seemed like we'd have two or three patients back to back who would have breast cancer in pregnancy and be seeing us. But it's one out of every 3,000 to 10,000 pregnancies may be affected by a breast cancer. And breast and cervical are going to account for 50% of the cancers diagnosed in pregnancy and up to a year postpartum. And thankfully, prognosis is similar to your non-pregnant patients. And so the discussion of terminating pregnancy does not improve their prognosis. However, if you're not diagnosing them and treating them appropriately, um, then that may impact their prognosis. So again, mammograms, little if any risk to the fetus. Anything that's suspicious should be biopsied. The pathologist needs to be aware that they're pregnant. Um, so that way they can make sure that those hormonal changes of pregnancy are not misread. Um, and um, they'll do all your normal receptor status uh, evaluation, whatnot. And you may be going down the road of genetic screening and whatnot as well. But discrete masses in pregnancy are difficult to identify because of the natural engorgement that happens. And so there is more commonly a delay up to over a year. So again, if you have a patient who you feel something and you're just not sure, it's better to err on the side of let's go ahead and get your imaging to confirm we're not missing something. Um, and ACOG recommends that as part of your prenatal exam, a comprehensive breast exam should be included. Um, and I know sometimes that isn't happening um, because we're not getting enough time to do all the paperwork, all the teaching, all the review of results, and then on top of that, still have to do an exam. But nobody said you had to do it at the first visit. It can be done at their second visit. If it hadn't been done in their first visit, it could be done at their confirmation visit if you have time. So it's just a matter of making sure it gets done if they haven't been seen for an annual with exam. So what are this patient's risk factors, Brooke? Whatever you remember. So, um... Her age mm -hmm. is not a table risk factor, but she is 39. She has occupational exposure by being an x-ray tech. Are we talking just of overall cancer or her breast mass? Breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, so you got it. It's her age, her job. Hormonal status. Mm -hmm. I think she had a family history, like an aunt or a grandma or somebody. Um. I don't remember if she smokes. Yep, her she did. <laughs> they all do. Her birth control yep. would be more protective for her ovarian cancer risk, but she's pregnant now, so that's not a concern. Um, I think that about covers it. Yep, you got most of them. So don't forget also, early menarche will increase your risk for uh, breast cancers. She had contraceptive use, so that extra hormonal exposure obesity, sedentary lifestyle kind of go together. So those are just additional risk factors, um, tobacco and alcohol use. So she had more tobacco use. And then don't forget about the lymphoma component. Um, you want to know what kind of treatments they had. So don't just list they had lymphoma. If she had chest radiation, that dramatically increases her risk for lymphoma. And even if she wasn't pregnant, you were just seeing her at 38 years of age for a routine annual that patient population, you may want to consider screening earlier or for any hesitancy, like you go, oh, well, maybe I feel something immediately. I have one who, who was just waiting on her, lympho her, on her um, breast cancer and she did get her breast cancer because they cured her lymphoma with radiation, but she ended up with her breast cancer. All right, so general concerns about um, breast cancer. So surgery is appropriate if indicated by the cancer. Um, but you have to be aware of anesthesia exposure risks, so timing it in the appropriate trimester and the appropriate medication use. 
Don't forget that pregnancy by itself will increase risk for thromboembolism. This patient is also sedentary, obese, and about to undergo surgery, and cancer itself will increase their risk, so um, anticoagulants in a prophylactic manner would be reasonable. And again, early stage disease, so your stage one and two, you could do a modified radical mastectomy. That would be your standard of care. Late stage diseases that are diagnosed in pregnancy have a pretty low survival um, rate. So regardless of treatment, um, so you definitely wouldn't want to um, terminate a pregnancy necessarily for treatment because it doesn't change anything. And so lactation suppression does not improve survival. Um, but if they're on chemotherapy for treatment, then they want to avoid lactation, of course, for exposure for fetus or baby. So here are some of your chemo considerations. Um, some may be used in pregnancy, but a lot of times people will avoid uh, them in the first trimester due to potential risk for miscarriage, malformations, or fetal death. Um, later pregnancy exposure may be associated with growth restriction, low birth weights, preterm deliveries, but also the physiologic changes of pregnancy. I know you've all had those lectures about all the things that change. So remember the chemotherapy or any medications you're giving um, will have increased hepatic oxidation rates, increased renal clearances, increased plasma volumes, increased third spaces to consider in terms of your dosing and of medication. All right, so these are quick, very short blurbs on the different chemo agents that you may see. Um, so methotrexate obviously is gonna have the greatest harm potential and your 5-FU can be used after organogenesis, but here's your test question, hand foot syndrome, also known as Palmer plantar, I can't pronounce, PPE, and it gives you these weird skin rash swelling feeling on the palms and soles, usually five to six weeks after the onset of treatment. Anti-tumor tumor antibiotics, doxorubicin, that's the one we always think about if someone had exposure to that and now they're pregnant, they need an echo. Got to make sure that they have normal cardiac function because heart failure is a consideration. Um, they can have acute renal failure during the time of uh, treatment, but also much later in life. So definitely, again, you'd want to evaluate that. Epirubicin, same thing, heart failure, later life leukemia. Um, and then this other adirubicin you wouldn't use in pregnancy typically, um, but heart failure, the PPE syndrome, fetal loss. So your alkylating agents, these are ones you're going to hear more about. So cyclophosphamide is the hemorrhagic cystitis. That's what they're going to ask you on your test questions. Cisplatin is going to be your sensory neuro hearing losses and your neuropathies, some neural renal, excuse me, toxicity. Carboplatin is going to be that neuropathy. Also, again, autotoxicity, neurotoxicity. Your toxins, your doxotaxol is going to give you the neuropathy and liver issues and paclitaxel, hypersensitivity and a peripheral neuropathy. So most of these will give you some degree of a neuropathy potentially, but test-wise, hemorrhagic cystitis, the sensory neural hearing losses, the heart failure, those are the ones that they ask you about. But you want to think about when you're seeing the patient. Um, so that way, if they had a history of treatment for breast cancer, for example, or another uh, cancer that required that as their treatment, you would want to make sure you have their baseline heart function, or if they came in for preconceptual counseling, get that echo as part of your preconceptual counseling to make sure they have normal cardiac function, because they may not have that done with their primary. Herceptin, you're going to see being used in your HER2 new patients. Um, if you're using in pregnancy, oligo and fetal renal sufficiency could develop, therefore it is avoided. Um, the is the epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. Um, there is no data, but it's going to be your metastatic diseases. Um, Avastatin you've heard of, I can't pronounce its generic name. Again, you're not going to see it used in pregnancy because it has pretty significant ang anti-angiogenic effects. And that's like a main development process for pregnancy. So obviously you would not want to use that. Tamoxifen has been found to be teratogenic. There are fetal anomalies and abnormalities reported, so therefore it should be postponed till the postpartum timeframe. So if your patient does have one of the better option chemotherapies given during pregnancy, either um, neoadjuvant or post-procedure, um, then you would hold off on your tamoxifen until they were delivered, assuming it was indicated. Um, but don't forget when they're receiving chemotherapy, many of these patients are going to need antiemetics. So you have a variety of categories that may be reasonable to consider. Obviously that neutropenic fevers may occur. So you're going to choose your antibiotics wisely in terms of what's safe for pregnancy. You're going to have pain management. So again, you're going to be kind of limited to primarily things like Tylenol, 
Um, and even that now there's more limitations on grams per day uh, recommendation, because of course, you're not going to want to use NSAIDs continuously or run the risk of opioid dependence in pregnancy. Many of these treatments will also lead to anemia. So you have uh, the option of some of these stimulating factor uh, medications, but um, some of the data is limited in pregnancy on the other categories. So you may find that blood transfusions would be more appropriate for your pregnant patient than your non-pregnant patient as a first line. So radiotherapy or radiation, it should be reconsidered. It is not recommended uh, in pregnancy. Typically, the recommendation is to plan for it after um, delivery um, because it can have carcinogenic effects, even if it doesn't cause any anomalies for the baby, carcinogenic effects for that child in their first decade of life. Um, if you have pelvic malignancy, then obviously if you treat with radiation, that's a more direct uh, exposure and you want to be very careful. Um, but things that will tell you that your adverse effects are dependent on, which would be common sense, gestational age of exposure, the field of exposure, how much fractionation and radiation dose you had. Going back to that patient about the x-ray technician, that her job being an, a risk factor, actually that's quite low. I've taken care of a lot of uh, people in the radiation oncology division over at the med center and a couple of different x-ray techs. And during pregnancy, they actually have them wear little, they're like octagon shaped badges um, that they wear at their waistline on their clothing uh, and on their scrubs. And they turn it in once every 30 days and they check how much radiation exposure they've had. And if there's any problems, they notify them. None of them have ever had wearing the appropriate gear that they're supposed to wear pregnant or non-pregnant. They've never had excessive levels of radiation exposure in pregnancy or outside of pregnancy. So that's always good to know. So as long as she's wearing her appropriate protective um, uh, lead shield and getting out of the way and moving away further, she should be fine. Um, the one part that you do see people kind of forgetting about is having that thyroid shield if they're working uh, in radiation frequently. All right, next patient. So I think we've covered breast uh, disease and pregnancy uh, enough. So we've got Miss Sylvia Ramos. She's a transfer of care. So she's coming in to see you. She's a multip, 21 and 5 by her LMP. Uh, she just moved here from Texas a month ago, but she originally moved here from moved to the States from Honduras two years ago. She had two OB visits in Texas and an ultrasound, but didn't have any of her records with her um, at the time of your visit. She says she has normal fetal movement, no contractions, leaking, discharge, headaches, vision changes, breast masses, anything. She does, however, report some post bleeding. She has had some swelling, some dysuria, some urinary frequency. And of course, she continues to have some intermittent nausea and vomiting. She's had some bloating and early satiety, um, but she just attributes that to the normal pregnancy stuff. And of course, some pelvic pressure because she's a multi. She denies any past medical history. She had an open appendectomy in childhood in Honduras. She's single, but she's been monogamous for the last five years. She denies any tobacco, alcohol, or drug use. She's not currently working, but is looking for work. Family history of a grandma with cervical cancer, diabetes and a couple of family members, uh, infertility, nothing super exciting. Here's her OBGYN history. Started at age nine, so young age, monthly cycles, five to seven days, never used any pills or hormonal therapies for contraception, denies any sexually transmitted infections. But oh, by the way, I never had a pap smear either because they didn't offer it in her home country where she lived in the remote area. She's not had dyspareunia, um, but she does admit to some sexual abuse in the past when you start talking about her sexual history and decides she does not want to talk to you more about that. She's currently sexually active with men. Um, she started sexual activity at age 12, and she has had more than five lifetime partners, um, but the current partner has been monogamous for five years. Here's her OB history. So she had a vaginal delivery at home in 2006, a couple of miscarriages, then she had a preterm delivery that passed away um, by the time she made it to the hospital locally. Um, and then she had a term delivery. And then number six is the current pregnancy. And that's the only one that's been in the United States. So her vitals, not horribly exciting. BMI is 22. Urine's negative. You just see a little trace blood. Fundal height's uh, a little increased because she was 21 and 5. 
but we don't have an ultrasound yet. Heart rate was present and you don't see any swelling. So Benton, what, well, no, Benton answered some questions. Let's see who else we got here. Uh, Brock, what are your next steps in this patient? And what are your, what's some of your differential? Um, so, I mean, obviously getting a, just a thorough history, I would want to set her up with our ultrasound text because I don't really trust outside ultrasound text. Um, so what are you ultrasounding? What are you looking for? I'm sorry. What kind of, what kind of ultrasound are you looking for? I would want to do probably an anatomy, honestly, to make sure everything's okay. Um, with the, she had the postcordial bleeding. I would want to offer a pap and, and just do testing. Um, if they what? didn't do a pap, I would assume that they wouldn't do testing um, for like gonorrhea and chlamydia and things like that um, and go from there. Okay. So we're going to try to get those records. Maybe we'll be successful, at least the ones out of Texas. You, correct. We're going to get her anatomy ultrasound. Um, you can discuss genetic screening because, again, she kind of falls in that window, at least for a quad screen. Um, and worst case, if her dates are changed, you can always recalculate or tell her that it didn't fall in the correct uh, time frame to be able to do it. And again, just like anybody else, schedule uh, their follow-up, review and update immunizations. Um, and then you may consider a urine culture on this patient, even though your UA wasn't really exciting. She had enough urinary symptoms. You may consider that. And then if you could not get her records, you may consider repeating or redrawing her labs and her pap smear. So you got all of that. So you get her, ultra, her records uh, later that day or at her next visit. And it confirms that she has uh, appropriate dates consistent with a nine week scan. And they saw a complex cyst on the right ovary. You don't have images, you just have the report. The lab panel otherwise is unremarkable. Her pap smear was good. Her culture that you ended up sending was negative. She did have a quad screen that ended up being an elevated amniotic fluid protein. Um, so that gave her the reading of an increased risk for a neural tube defect. And then her ultrasound that you did after your visit for follow-up shows a singleton, head down, left lateral placenta, anterior, normal fluid, normal anatomy, it's a little girl. And, oh, you see this adnexal mass complex with mostly solid components. And you do see a prominent flow signal within the mass. Um, and you can't really identify a specific ovary. You don't see a whole lot of fluid and your cervix is closed. And here is a pretty picture. What's your thoughts? I think I would want to do um, tumor markers and, and lab again. Okay. How are you going to account for the pregnancy changes in some of those tumor markers and which tumor markers are you going to look at? Um, well, well, with AFP, um, obviously her beta HCG is going to be elevated. You do AFP, you want to do, um, gosh. Um, is, so that's was, part of the, that's there part of no, the complexity. There was no part of um, the anatomy ultrasound that showed any like um, neural tube or abdominal defect. Nothing, nothing. your anatomy was completely normal. Okay. Um, let's see. So uh, the CA125, uh, um, the CA19, hit or miss, the CEA. Um, I'm going to save you. Thank you. <laughs> so second trimester, she's asymptomatic for the most part. It has increased in size. So we have a report of four centimeters. And now we're greater than six centimeters. So if we were gonna consider surgery, because if we had a concern that this might be a, a borderline or malignant tumor, um, this would be the best time to do it um, or in the immediate postpartum period. And then depending on what is found, if it is a tumor, since we are talking malignancy and pregnancy, uh, chemotherapy would be determined by the tumor type as well as whether it's safe for pregnancy or not. But you have to remember that, um, so her diagnosis was a dysgerminoma. But for this, you have to remember all of your tumor markers are going to be potentially affected by your pregnancy. So they're not very valuable in pregnancy alone. 
But if you have increasing size of mass, especially one that's complex like this, and you don't think it's just a hemorrhagic cyst, um, you got to start thinking that this might be a borderline or malignant disease. But also, even if it's not, if it's increasing in size, you're um, increasing chances of having some sort of complication to the pregnancy or ovarian torsion or whatnot, and then leading to an emergent procedure, especially if it ruptures and they have sudden onset of severe pain and have peritoneal signs, you kind of want to avoid that. Um, so with the increase in size, hers is not dramatic. I have one patient, she's pregnant again this time, but last pregnancy, they found a complex mass at her dating scan. They brought her back, I think two or three weeks later, and it had doubled in size. And by the time she saw Dr. Kramer, um, I think he did her surgery at 18 weeks. The mass itself was almost 20 centimeters. It was huge. And it was a mucinous cyst adenoma. Um, so, and I've got another one like that. I just sent him who has a very similar story, very similar appearance, um, except has more concerning personal risk factors for a malignancy based on family history. So again, don't hesitate to reach out to your GYN oncology friends. But this patient had a dysgerminoma. The majority of these are going to present as stage one. They're going to be unilateral. Um, so again, if you're trying to preserve fertility, you're going to do least invasive uh, that you can. But again, here's your testing. So these are all affected by pregnancy. So did this patient have a neural tube defect? Probably not, but it may have been related to her dysgerminoma. How do you know? You don't until you take it out. Um, so you're going to do platinum-based chemotherapies. Hold on, my dog is going nuts. Well, I don't know how to make it mute. All right. Um, so again, you're going to do labs, um, but again, they're not going to be very helpful. You might use them just for baseline. You're going to have platinum-based chemotherapies as your standard of care. And then second line is going to include radiation, but obviously not in pregnancy. Um, and then long-term postpartum, um, you're going to have to worry about all of your other issues. So radiation specifically, but also um, your risk of menopause sterility. So ovarian failure, it's definitely something to consider. So for 1A, you wouldn't even do any uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, even though there's about a 10 to 15% uh, recurrence risk. Um, the good thing is, is the majority of these will respond to chemotherapy later down the line. So you don't have to be overly aggressive uh, on the 1As. Um, if you are able to resect the 1B, 1C, you can give them a little bit of, of chemo um, for four cycles, but don't forget bleomycin. Again, here's your test questions, pulmonary toxicity. You would do this in second, third trimester, avoid first. Uh, at a top side, you can get leukemia. If you have high cumulative doses over the long run, you can use in second and third trimesters. And cisplatin is going to give you the nephroneurotoxicities, but again, safe in second and third trimesters. This would be if appropriate and indicated by your disease diagnosis and standard of care treatments. In general, this is even obviously more rare than breast cancers in pregnancy, so much lower incidence. Um, the majority of the masses you will find in the first trimester, so when you get that dating scan back and you have a, like a six centimeter ovarian cyst or something, most of those are gonna go away on their own and they're usually benign re lesions. Those that uh, continue are gonna be these. They're gonna fall into, you might have that pedunculated fibroid, just a general simple cyst that you're not worried about, but you might find an endometrioma, a cyst adenoma or a teratoma. And you all know the classic pictures for teratomas. Malignant and borderline tumors will account for three to 6% of the lesions identified. The statistics vary because again, it's not that common. Tumor markers, again, not very helpful. You're gonna primarily rely on your imaging. And here's your breakdown on your pathology types. So germ cells, epithelia is gonna be your most common. The least common is gonna be a sex cord. So epithelial germ sex cord. And if you think about it, the easiest way to remember that, that's alphabetical in terms of incidence. Delaying surgery may increase risk for bleeding, cystic rupture, torsion, and need for emergent surgery. So it's not ideal necessarily. Um, but if it's diagnosed late in pregnancy and you know delivery soon, you may be able to delay it till their postpartum. You definitely want to stage them when you do their surgery past the first trimester. So that includes your washings, peritoneal biopsies, omentectomy, lymph nodes, if appropriate, and they're enlarged. Um, even in advanced disease, you may consider fertility sparing uh, treatments um, if the contralateral ovary is uh, normal. 
um, but you only want to consider it for the epithelial in the early stage diseases. All right, last patient. I have a question. Yes. If you have a patient who has a teratoma and it's not, like it's a mature teratoma in pregnancy, would you strongly advise one way or another in terms of removing it due to the risk of torsion or would you um, just give them, you know, the like advise them one way or another and let them decide what they would prefer to do? I think it would depend on if they're clinically uh, symptomatic and also the size. If it's like a two centimeter teratoma, I mean, I don't see that yeah. being an issue. If it's a five or six centimeter teratoma, it's more likely to also be symptomatic that may be one you would consider removing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a discussion of good counseling about risks and benefits. Since it's, if the imaging shows you that you have no suspicions for any malignant component to it, it's not changing in size, it's stable. Um, waiting may be the more appropriate option. Um, mm -hmm. If it's changing in size or somehow it appears different um, and or it's symptomatic, then that patient, it may be worth the risk of doing surgery uh, in pregnancy because it's mm -hmm. not a no risk. I mean, you still have yeah. anesthesia consequences. You have risk of preterm labor um, if it's done laparoscopically, um, depending on how ports are placed and who's doing it. Um, you can uh, find your way into the uterus with your trocar. That has happened on some of our patients with surgery before when they went and placed their trocars for their gallbladder surgeries in pregnancy. So depending on who's doing it, we're not planning photoscopy. <laughs> but it has happened. So just something to keep in mind. So you have to talk about the risks and have an educated uh, discussion with your patient. It may be one you have over multiple visits, depending on the health literacy and understanding of your patient and your clinical suspicion for this being an issue. But a one or two centimeter, you'd probably leave alone. Okay. All right, Miss Tracy Smith, here's your drop-in. You know how much we love our drop-ins. 37 and one weeks comes in for vaginal bleeding after voiding. She's in town visiting her family, supposedly has prenatal care in North Carolina, but of course you have no access to records. It's late night, so you can't get access from anywhere because clinics are closed. She tells you baby's moving, no discharge, contractions are leaking. Um, just this bleeding after voiding today. She has fatigue, lots of joint pains, especially her pelvis, hips, and low back, kind of what you might expect for 37 weeker. And then, oh, by the way, because you look at her arms and ask about it, she's got some easy bruising. She's also had some bleeding gubs when she's brushed her teeth throughout pregnancy, especially in the later half. She's not gained a whole lot of weight, only about 15 pounds, but she doesn't really have any nausea, vomiting. Um, right now, she's on antibiotics because she's had recurrent UTIs in pregnancy, a few hot flashes and night sweats, shortness of breath with some exertion, but really no chest pain or palpitations. Nothing super exciting overall. She has seasonal allergies, these recurrent UTIs. She's had sinusitis. Her teeth have been pulled. She's monogamous for the last two years. No tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. She's working full-time. She exercises regularly. No really significant family or OBGYN history. Not taking anything but vitamins. She's 120 pounds, five foot one, so low BMI. Her fundal height's appropriate. You get heart tones. Of course, your NST is going to be reactive. You do your speculum exam, see a little bit of blood, but nothing actively bleeding. Everything looks closed. You're not seeing contractions, but she does look kind of pale when you see her. Um, you see, you hear maybe a possible systolic murmur. Who knows? You don't see any contractions. Her reflexes are normal. You do see bruising on the arms and maybe a little bit of petechiae on her lower extremities. Her sclera are white. And she might have some axillary lymph nodes. Uh, that she brings up as you're kind of looking all over her. All right, so differential, Broadway. Tell me what we're going to do next, what you think is going on. Third trimester bleeding. I have to rule out pregnancy thing. So where's her placenta? Um, her strips reactive, so I'm less concerned about abruption, cervicitis things. Um, hopefully she had a pap. Um, she's young, she's 18, so she didn't. Okay. She, wait, she didn't? No, she's 18. Oh. Um, we'll get a CBC, maybe some coags, depending on how bad her bleeding is. I think that's as far as I want to go. Awesome. So you got all this. So you found it was a fundal placenta, normal fluid. You went ahead and did a growth and it was appropriate. You didn't see anything on your tracing. And here's your kicker. So what are you thinking? Dun, dun, dun. She's got the pancytopenia. 
Mm-hmm. Look at that hemoglobin. No, I'm worried about hem- um, leukemia. Um, so she needs a hemon consult and an admission and some transfusions. Yep. So peripheral smear is going to be helpful. So you can have that done while you're waiting um, for the hemoc to see. And they usually like to go look at their own smears too, not just rely on how the lab reads it. And she'll likely need a bone marrow biopsy to confirm her diagnosis. So here's the breakdown. So acute leukemia is going to be your most common in your children, your teens, your young adults, which is where this patient falls. AML and your chronic uh, leukemia. Uh, leukemias are going to be the ones that are primarily your older patient population. It is deja vu, Benton. We had one of these patients or two of these patients actually recently, but they're kind of scary because I mean, who wants to deliver them? Yeah. Who wants to deliver them with a platelet count of nothing and no blood cells? It's not ideal. And being that anemic, you are worried about, um, n- perfusion and what baby's getting from an oxygen and nutritional standpoint. So we said greater than 50% of the malignancies in pregnancy are breast and cervical. The other quarter is going to be your hematologic. So you've got your leukemias and lymphomas to consider in that grouping. And then the rest are going to be everything else. So here's your summary of your incidents. So cervical and breast more common Then you've got your lymphoma, leukemias in here. Um, You've got ovarian cancers. And then some of the others of the others, the more common you're going to see is things like colon cancer and your skin malignant melanomas. So in summary, cancer is obviously a challenge when there's a pregnancy involved. Um, It's uncommon, thankfully. But as our patients are aging and also our patients have more comorbidities, more Lifestyle choices that increase their risk for cancers across the board, that's not very helpful. 50% of cancers are going to be diagnosed um, uh, in pregnancy are going to be your breast and cervical cancers. And for many of these things, termination of pregnancy does not typically improve the prognosis. But if you're not doing the appropriate diagnosis and treatment, that, of course, will impact your prognosis, pregnancy or not. And then depending on what your treatment of choice is going to be based on disease, You have to consider your surgery options, your anesthetics and your chemos relating to where you are in pregnancy and safety in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then of course, radiation is going to be the one you're going to delay till the postpartum um, period. And that is it. It was a quick, just a review of some of the common ones. I mean, we could have gone through and done all the statistics kind of like I did for the discharges, but I would have definitely had y'all napping and yawning. I thought doing some made up case scenarios loosely based on a variety of patients we've seen over the years would kind of make it a little easier to remember some of the statistics. Um, but it is challenging, um, but it is doable uh, in terms of treatment. I remember when I was a resident, I was doing a re- away rotation at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and we had a patient who had uterine sarcoma that was found when she was, oops, 18 or 20 weeks of pregnancy. And it was not at the stage of being resectable and they recommended radiation treatment as her only option for survival. So she did terminate her pregnancy. Then she had radiation and then she ended up having some sort of reaction. We didn't know if it was due to uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia or due to the pretty high dose radiation therapy to a very large field. Um, she ended up with essentially no platelets and passed away of what essentially was interpreted as DIC very soon after. It was horrible. I just remember her eight-year-old visiting and um, before she had her first treatment and then after it, it's, it can be really traumatic when you see it in pregnancy. But then you can also have the patient who just loses her hair in pregnancy and has to wear fun wigs and wraps and stuff and makes it through pregnancy with a healthy baby and is cured from her breast cancer uh, at the same time. So talk about scary all at once. Have y'all seen any patients with cancer here recently in pregnancy? Cause I haven't other than the big uh, borderline tumor things that I've sent to Kramer. There was a triple negative breast, breast cancer patient back in the back. I can't remember how long ago that was. Actively treating during pregnancy or history of? I'm pretty sure it was active. Okay. 
And because we've had a few, we've had a few patients with history of cancer who are now pregnant, particularly breast. And it's important to list that on their problems list, not so much that it affects what we do for pregnancy care necessarily, but we want to stop asking them about, are they going to breastfeed if they've had bilateral mastectomy? Because that gets old fast. And um, that's something that many of the patients are wishing they could have the option to do. And the more times we bring it up, the more um, emotionally challenging that could be for the patient. We were talking about that PML patient we had that delivered another baby. And this last pregnancy was the only time I've ever seen spina bifida in person. So we diagnosed her PML and triage because she was preterm labor. Oh, great. 